So now I'm going to get into this teaching today of the mysteries of healing and why not everyone we see be healed. This is going to be an in-depth teaching. I recommend you take notes. You're probably going to want to rewatch this. I recommend rewatching this after, but there's a lot to this teaching. This um, isn't something simple, but this is, this is mis there are mysteries here. It's, it's not something um, with an easy answer, but there are revelations from God that we can see in his word to help understand why some aren't healed. And if some aren't healed, how we can see them be healed. Amen. So first of all, the, the, in Isaiah 10, 27, it says that the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. It is the anointing, which is the power of God that moves through a vessel. Most of the time, that's how we're seeing the anointing, the power move through scripture, whether it's um, Moses, Elijah, Elisha, and then in the New Testament, Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, all the disciples, usually we are seeing healings and deliverances take place through vessels by the anointing, the power of God in a vessel flowing through them. So that anointing flowing through a vessel destroys the yoke. Um, there are two main things that release healing and deliverance to a person, and one of them is the anointing. Sometimes people are not receiving healing or deliverance simply because they have not encountered the anointing. Because as I said, usually we are seeing in the word and today, the anointing, the power of God that destroys yokes, that makes demons to go, that makes miracles to happen. Usually, most of the times it's happening through a vessel. And to be real, in the body of Christ today, it is not that common to see vessels walking in the anointing. It is not that common to see demons be cast out in the church, but it should be. This is how it was in the Acts church. And this is what God is restoring in the body of Christ today. So one of the reasons simply why we have not seen many people be healed, why we are not seeing many people be healed today is because they have not encountered the anointing and it is the anointing that destroys the yoke. So you, you can pray hard, you can have a strong faith, but if the anointing is not there, that yoke cannot be destroyed. When people get into the anointing, things happen so easily because it's, 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 it's God's principle. His anointing destroys the yoke. His anointing is all powerful, lacking in nothing. So in the time of Peter, we're seeing people come under the shadow of his anointing. He's passing by, his shadow is touching people. And it says, all of them were healed. Demons would just flee. People would be healed just by him passing by simply. He's not having to strive, to struggle, to scream loud. He's not having to gather everybody. Let's all pray over this one demon to come out at one time. He's not having to use physical force and effort. It, this is the power of the anointing. And this is God's simple principle where it's easy for miracles to happen. So this is one of the reasons people do not have faith or people do not know about the anointing or maybe people are skeptical about the anointing and so they're not positioning themselves. And there's, so they don't need to be sick. They don't need to be with this demon, but they're choosing to stay with it many times because they're not open-hearted to this new move of God that's doing that's not new according to the word of God, but it's rare today. It's new for many believers today. So that's the one, that's the one reason, okay? Now, the, two big, the two big things that release miracles is the anointing, positioning yourself where the anointing is. By the way, you, all of you are here on the live, you've positioned yourself where the anointing's flowing and so many miracles are happening on every live and they're gonna happen today. Um, but number two is, the number two reason, uh, I mean, the number two thing that ma releases miracles is faith. It says in the word of God that Jesus in his hometown, he couldn't do hardly any miracles because of the lack of faith, because of the unbelief. So um, miracles are not magic. 
the anointing is not magic. It's, prin it's these principles, these ways of God's instruction following them that releases them in the miracles. The instruction to just believe. Many times Jesus would be saying to people in the Bible, we see this several times, believe and your daughter will raise from the dead and will be well. Believe and you will be healed. Um, the woman with the issue of blood reached out to touch the hem of Jesus' garment and he felt power leave him and he said, your faith has made you well. So we see that this is literally a key that releases the miracles, faith. And you gotta have the right kind of faith. You gotta have, um, you gotta believe that Jesus wants to heal you. You gotta have the right kind of faith that, uh, uh, like understanding how God moves. Like a lot of people are like, I believe God can heal me. I believe God wants to heal me. But they're not having faith in the principle of positioning yourself where the anointing is. So you gotta have that right kind of faith where you believe in his word, like how he moved through Apostle Peter. Oh, when I position myself there, I will be healed under the shadow of the anointing. So in today's time, I need to find where God's power is flowing, where his anointing is moving as it was through Peter. And as I position myself there, I will be healed. You have to have that kind of faith. Um, and also the Bible says Isaiah 53, 5, by his stripes, you are healed. So this, first of all, first of all, this is where us as believers have this faith that we can be healed today and delivered today. Because in the word of God, it says that Jesus, what it's saying through the scripture is that Jesus endured scourging, a, a brutal whipping where there was sharp pieces on the end of the whip, pulling out even his flesh, where he was shedding all this blood, but it was on purpose. It wasn't in vain. It was for the purpose of you to receive healing today. It was the purpose of healing to become part of your inheritance as a child of God. We have this inheritance as a child of God. And many people don't know the fullness of this inheritance. Many people think it's only that they will go to heaven when they die or that it's only a relationship with God and that God comes and lives inside of you as a Holy Spirit. Many people stop short there, but there's more. And the more is that Jesus has come to bring abundant life. The devil came to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10, 10, but I have come that you would have life and have it more abundantly. So Jesus has also in this inheritance released abundant life to us, heaven on earth, abundant life on this earth. And that includes healing. And we know healing is a part of that. Deliverance is a part of that because of Isaiah 53, 5. By his stripes, you are healed. So we have to have the right kind of faith that healing and deliverance is my inheritance. That, that not only does Jesus want this for me and, he's, and he has the power to give it to me, but it's actually already mine. It's, an, it's my inheritance. So I need to just receive what's already there, what God has already given to me. I need to just receive it, receive it by faith and receive it by following God's principles of receiving that miracle of healing and deliverance, positioning yourself where the anointing is. That's, that's the simple ways of receiving healing and deliverance most of the time. Very simple. Believe the right kind of faith and position yourself where the anointing is. We don't need to overcomplicate it. I'm gonna talk about the complexities. There, the, there are more complexities to it. There are mysteries to it that I'm gonna to start to go into now. But what's important to know before I go into these complexities is that God wants us to keep what I just taught you really in your heart and to really believe in these things to not overcomplicate things in your head with what ifs, to not be like, I don't know if God wants to heal me. I don't know if it's his will. What if it doesn't happen? I don't know if I'm believing enough. I don't know if it'll work for me. I've heard all these testimonies, but I don't know if it'll work for me. He doesn't want us to get in our minds. He wants us to have childlike faith and stay in this place of childlike faith and believe in what I just shared with you. It's our job to believe that this is our inheritance, that we will receive it, and that we're going to do what God is calling us to do to receive these things, to, to position yourself where the anointing is, and to believe. 
So this is really like, I want you to get this in you. This is what should stay in your heart and let that just rest in your heart and be what you declare um, rather than overcomplicating things and getting in your mind too much. Because we lots of, sometimes we do see people not healed, and so that's where we can just get in our minds. And da, da, da. But God calls us to be childlike, and the more childlike and humble we can be, the more we will see God's abundant life in us, and the miracles and the healing and deliverance come to us. It's not our job to figure things out, but just to have that childlike faith and belief, this, the simple things that God is calling us to do and receive. Amen? So that's my precursor I want to share right now before I get into this like meaty teaching uh, that's deep. Okay, so um, the next part, okay, so, so what I just mentioned to you, most, most people, when they do these things, when they believe and position themselves where the anointing is, they're going to see miracles happen when it's true anointing, when it's powerful anointing, when, especially... Um, Especially when it's the anointing like Apostle Peter and Apostle Paul. It says that, it says in um, Acts 19, 11. I love this scripture because it's my birthday backwards. My birthday is 1191. But I love this scripture. God did such extraordinary miracles through the hands of Apostle Paul that they would bring handkerchiefs to his skin and his body, and they would bring the handkerchiefs and aprons to the sick and demon possessed, and they'd be healed and they'd be delivered. So what this verse is saying is that there was such an extraordinary anointing in Apostle Paul that the miracles were happening with so much ease, just bringing the handkerchiefs, touching the people. And so um, especially when it's that kind of anointing, when even principalities must go, you're gonna see miracles happen so easily. And that's why you're seeing Apostle Peter, it says all of them were healed. When they, when they came under his shadow, it literally says all of them were healed. And a big reason is because the anointing level was so high that principalities didn't stand a chance. They couldn't fight. They had to obey. So, this, so what I just shared, the simple principles of faith and the anointing is gonna be the case for most people of what's all that's needed to release the miracle. For most people. But now we're going to get into the complexities, which is not the majority, but more of the minority um, of what, why other people might not see healing or what's needed more than these things to see the healing. So the next thing I'm going to mention is, and one of the first things it says is, uh, it talks about in um, Jesus speaks to Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom. Peter, I give you the keys of the kingdom. There are keys in the spiritual realm that unlock people from the devil's bondage, that access the heavenly realm and bring it here on heaven. There's keys that unlock things in the spiritual realm. And they were given to Peter. They were entrusted to Peter. Peter as an apostle, Peter as a leader of the church, as a foundation of the church. And then Peter had a responsibility to use these keys and unlock people from their bondage. Uh, these keys include seeing things in the spiritual realm, God revealing things in the spiritual realm, and saying this is a prophetic direction for this person that will unlock them from bondage, for example. Um, but also he had this responsibility to teach about these keys, like what I'm doing right now, teach on what these keys are so that other people could receive the keys themselves and that the, the, the keys would be passed down from Peter and so that spiritual understanding eyes would open up so that others are now able to have the keys and use the keys and know how to use the keys to unlock others from demonic bondage. So there are different keys. I'm going to mention one key that I've seen through in my ministry where it's not a key for every time. It's just certain instances, a key that unlocks a person's deliverance. So one of these keys is this. I was in Houston a year ago, actually, about almost exactly a year ago, at a powerful Revival Is Now event where there are several hundreds who came. We were in the cold. It was so beautiful. We were outside in the cold and people didn't care because they were hungry and so many people were set free. And then there was this one mother who brought her child. He was probably eight to 10 years old. 
and she said, I've brought him, he's, he's possessed, he manifests. Um, and he was manifesting at the time, very obviously. Demons speaking out of him, laughing out of him. And she spoke to me, she said, I brought him to many deliverance ministries and no, he hasn't been able to be helped. He hasn't been free. It's like no one knows what to do. He just manifests and we don't see the freedom. And so as I'm, as she's speaking to me, God reveals to me prophetically that she had sowed into the devil's kingdom a lot, like with psychics, something like that he had revealed to me. So I, God led me to ask her. And I spoke, did you ever sow a lot of money into the devil's kingdom in any way? She says, yes, I used to give hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of dollars to psychics. Um, and so there's this principle in the Bible of sowing and reaping, that what you sow, you will reap. And, um, you know, Jesus, when you give your life to Jesus, he makes you new. Your old past self is gone. But if you have sown a lot into the devil's kingdom, there's still a reaping that it, it's like it's like a it's like you're in the deficit in some areas. Just like when you're saved by Je when Jesus saved, when you give your life to Jesus, you're not immediately free sometimes. And this is why we're seeing so many believers needing freedom because um, the areas in their soul the junk from the past is there some for example someone's been free uh saved but they still have an addiction they still have depression they still have anxiety they still have suicidal thoughts and so when you give your life to jesus these areas of bondage don't all go right away from for many people they need to encounter the anointing to destroy the yoke and so in that same way just because you've given your life to jesus it if you sowed so much in the devil's kingdom there is that reaping there still and so that means you can be really like in the deficit and so sometimes sometimes not always but sometimes in cases like this a key that unlocks this bondage is sowing into god's kingdom it's not giving to a person giving to a minister or giving to a ministry but it's sowing into god's kingdom that's what you're doing and yes it, the work of god is god's kingdom so it happens as you sow into the work of God, but you are really sowing into God's kingdom and it's taking one out of the deficit that they sowed into the devil's kingdom. Sometimes that's just the key that unlocks that deliverance because that bondage is a specific bondage. The reason that bondage is staying there is specifically because of that reason of sowing into the demonic kingdom. Um, so anyways, I, I, I revealed this to her and I said, you don't have to give to my ministry, just give to where God's power is moving, is what I said. Because I, I wanted to make sure she knew it was not about like, it's not about paying me for a miracle or something. It's, that, 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 that is never how we should ever operate as ministers, as deliverance. We should never, it's never a transaction. Never, ever, ever. Because the miracles of God, we are, we are freely given the anointing. We are freely given miracles from God and we need to freely release them to others. The Bible says freely you receive, freely give. So the miracles from God are free and we as vessels must make sure that we are giving them for free or allowing God to freely give them to his people instead of misrepresenting God wrongly, instead of um, like manipulating people and um, misrepresenting what vessel who god is that he's like give me money he's not like that he freely gives them but there are sometimes keys that unlock this deliverance and it has nothing to do with giving god money giving a ministry money but it has to do with the power of the seed because it's about it's not about the money it's about when when one gives money that's a sacrifice and that's a surrender the more we surrender to God, the more abundant life we're going to receive from him. And sometimes we're holding on to money and we're not surrendering that to God. And that's keeping us in bondage. We also see in the Bible that many times when servants of God, when people of God made a sacrifice, God would then move. God would then do a miracle. The sacrifice moved the hand of God. Uh, for example, Many people know the story of Solomon, how um, God appeared to him and said, I'll give you whatever you want. What, or, what do you want? What's the request you have, a prayer request? And he says, I want wisdom. He asks for wisdom. And then God says, 
because you asked for this, I'll give you this and more. I'll give you so much more than you asked for. I will make you wealthy and everything and be high ranked. And, um, but many people, what they don't realize, if you look at that scripture, the verse right before it says that Solomon actually made a sacrifice to God. And so after he made an offering, a sacrifice to God, God showed up. We also see Noah when he came, um, finally he landed on solid ground after the flood for many, many days. Um, he made a sacrifice to the Lord as soon as he arrived on land. He made an offering and as soon as he did that, God shows up and he says, um, I, will, I will make you a promise now. I will no longer wipe you out, wipe out humanity with a flood. Um, also, um, David, David, um, he made a sacrifice to God and even somebody told him like, hey, I'll give you livestock so you can make a sacrifice to God. And David was like, no, I need to make a sacrifice, something that's gonna be uncomfortable for me. I can't take your livestock. I'm gonna, I need to make my own sacrifice because he understood this principle, this importance of sowing, of how this was more of a surrender to God, that this was something that God's asking you to do and the power that comes with the seed. And so the Bible says that he gives this, um, this sacrifice to God, he makes his offering and God immediately shows up right after that and says, I'm, I'm going to end this plague because of the sacrifice. So that's the thing where this, this, this key of sowing, it's about the principle of sowing. It's about the sacrifice. It's about the surrender. That's what it is that releases these miracles, that releases the bondage sometimes, sometimes. Um, and an amazing testimony happened this week. I just posted on my Revival Is Now uh, TV show. I have a playlist on my YouTube channel um, called Revival Is Now TV. And um, I just posted on Saturday my newest episode and I was teaching on sowing and reaping. And I was teaching specifically on sowing, on sowing and reaping when it comes to sowing financially, sowing to the work of God. But I didn't teach anything that I just taught you right now. I didn't teach on that program about any connection to sowing and deliverance. I didn't teach on deliverance at all. I was just simply teaching on the power of our seeds. And someone testified that, I shared this on Sunday, uh, yesterday at church. Someone testified that she's been delivered from so many things while tuning in on, online to these lives. As you're tuning in right now, she's been delivered of so many things over I think a year or something. And um, she said, actually, let me read it, I have it right here, um, the testimony. I've been watching you for over a year. I've been delivered from so many things, but my depression and anxiety lingered for this whole time for some reason. God put it on my heart to give $20, and then in the video you said to give double if that's what he's asking you to. Because two weeks ago, Pastor Heather testified that God spoke to her to give double, and she gave double to Fivefold Church, and immediately there was this wild double increase in her ministry where more people, many more people started coming and giving and in her business. And so God led me to share, if someone's, if someone out there, God's speaking to the same thing, I want to declare a blessing over you now. Obey God if he's saying that. So anyways, she heard that testimony in it. So she says, so you said to give double if that's what he's asking. So I went, I, she felt him asking that to her. So I went to your website right after the video and gave $40, which was about all the money I had left in my bank account for the month. In capital letters, she says, right after I gave, I was delivered from my depression and anxiety. I felt the presence of God so strongly. I'm not worried about how I'm giving, going to make it through the rest of the month because I know he is going to provide. I am confident he will. My faith has grown stronger too in just a moment. He moved so strongly. I am overjoyed and so at peace. When before I gave, I was worried about how I was going to eat and get through the month. But now I know God is going to provide and I'm not one bit concerned about it anymore. It was lifted from me. The heaviness of the worry about how will I make it through the month is gone. So this is powerful. In her case, um, she her bondage was... was uh, anxiety and worry that God would not provide. I don't know if God's going to provide and I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm going to be uh, without money for my bills. So because that was her specific bondage area, her sowing the seed was her act of surrender and sacrifice. And that was a key that delivered her 
from that anxiety and depression. I didn't share to do that in the message. I didn't talk about any connection to sewing and deliverance, nothing like that. But God led her to do that and she got freed. Powerful. And I'm just realizing right now that I hadn't, I didn't share with you the end of the testimony of that woman with her son in Houston, who she had given lots of money to a psychic. So the end of the story is that I, sh I shared with her, you don't ha have to give to my ministry because I wanted to, under to understand it's about the principle of sowing where God's power is moving, his kingdom. So, but she decides, I just go on to minister to other people. I had prayed for the boy. I had commanded demons to go. They're not going. And that's when God revealed to me, no, there's a key that's needed to unlock this specific bondage. So anyways, I just shared with her and I didn't like stand there waiting for her to sew or anything. I just shared what God led me to share. And I just moved on to minister to other people. There were so many demons manifesting, so many people needing freedom. So I'm going on and praying for other people. She runs up to me and like stops me as I'm ministering like, 15-ish, 20 minutes later maybe, and she says, I, she's laying on the ground with her son who's manifesting, it's standing on the ground outside. She says, I whipped out my phone and I decided to sow a seed to your ministry and the moment I hit send, right after I hit send, he started coughing. He started coughing tons, coughing out demons and he was free. He was immediately free and here he's standing there. I'm looking at him free. Then they come back the next day and testify. And this little boy is so precious. He's just acting like a normal little boy and is just, just smiling so big. And the mom's overcome because she had tried so many times to get him deliverance. And finally he was freed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this is why some people don't see their freedom because there's another key that's needed. It could be this key that I'm mentioning today and they need to unlock that key. And that could just, that just looks like surrendering to God. When you surrender to God, God will reveal that key to you. Sometimes it can look like a minister, like God using a vessel to speak prophetically, this is the key. Or sometimes it's just your surrender, like that w girl watching my video. She was just like in a place of surrender. In a pl so she sewed and that was God giving her that key in that moment. So, the big key is to surrender, to be humble, childlike. So faith, anointing, surrender. That's, these are the biggest keys, the, the keys to receiving healing and deliverance. When you surrender, God leads you perfectly. You know, whether it's in the, in the scenario I mentioned where God just, you hear, okay, he wants me to give and this is hard, but I just want to surrender and he releases the key that way, or he releases it through a minister speaking, for example. But he'll be so faithful to release those keys to you when, if that's what you need, when you fully surrender. All right, so, okay, now we're gonna get really into the, the, the more mysteries. <laughs> we're going deeper and deeper. <laughs> um, so, I want to talk about 2 Corinthians 12, 6, where we see Paul talking about a thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 12, 6, it says, um, Paul says, Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. So Paul is having a thorn in the flesh, which can be, a thorn in the flesh can be a sickness. And... First of all, I want to mention that though we're not perfect, we are human, it is possible for us to be transformed into the image of a God where we can fully be surrendered to him and never fall into pride and stay humble. It's possible. But then there's some other cases where God can just see that without a thorn in the flesh, he just knows the heart and it can be a good heart. And God loves a person so much and God wants to use them so powerfully, but God can see without this thorn that the, the pride could, could come in, the ego could come in, um, the, the lack of relying completely on God could come in. And, and this is a mystery. This is a complexity because this is not something I can say it's going to be the case for people like this or this is going to be the case for most people. It's, it's not a most people type thing, the thorn in the flesh. It's an every person type thing that we will all have weaknesses. We will all have weaknesses. Like I have weaknesses that I need to rely on God for. Um, 
preaching was always a weakness for me and I still, I see how God's empowered me and given me revelation and given me words to speak and strength. But it's still, a, I see a weakness in me where I must rely on God, I must lean on Him. And I see sometimes how I, I wish it would, be, it would be easier, it would be more of a breeze and comfortable, but God allows it to be uncomfortable and not a breeze and in a place of just such obe obedience and reliance on Him to help keep me humble and help me to always remember that it's Him doing everything. It's not me and my own strength and that I need Him that even though I've grown, I've transformed, even if I'm successful, I need God. I desperately need Him. And it's only His grace and mercy that I'm able to do anything. It's only by His grace and mercy that there is success in life and blessings. It's only Him. Amen. So, once again, this is a complexity type thing where I just want to mention now that thorn in the flesh can be a thing for some people. It's not something I can tell you this amount of people will have this or if you're like this, you will have this. But it's just one of those mysteries that there can be a thorn in the flesh sometimes where God will allow something, not just a weakness, but something, a thing of discomfort, a thorn, and it it's possible it could be sickness, it's possible, and pain, um, it, because he wants you to stay humble and he knows that that's necessary. With this though, there should always be abundant life still. It's not like a lack of abundant life. There will be, there will be peace, there will be joy. It, it, it's just a reminder that this earth is temporary and that we need God and that we, we cannot do anything without him. Amen. Um, but I just, I really do want to mention when I talk about how, as I'm sharing with you, that thorn in the flesh, it's a possibility. It's not like a majority thing where God doesn't want you to be thinking whenever, when you're sick or when you're oppressed and maybe you're trying for a while to get healed and delivered and you're not seeing breakthrough. He doesn't want it to necessarily pop in your mind like, well, this could be my thorn in the flesh. As I shared in the beginning, he wants you to keep that simple heart of, I'm believing in complete abundant life and the inheritances of, and the inheritance of God, that by his stripes I'm healed. He wants you to stay in that place because if we don't stay in that place, we could be limiting God. We could be um, not wanting to be disappointed and so we put a limit on God and limit our faith and say, well, maybe this is a thorn in the flesh. Um, so I don't know if I'll really believe anymore since it's been a while and I haven't been healed or delivered yet. That's why what I'm sharing today is, is, is complex and we're not supposed to go in there and try to figure things out with our, with our mind and just have this childlike heart and just trust in God through everything and believe it, that he is a God of miracles. Amen. Um, also, in regards to thorn of the flesh, I just want to mention that it says in John 16, 3, that I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So it's no secret that in this world we will have troubles, we will have trials. Um, also, 2 Corinthians 5.1 says, For we know that if the earthly tent, our physical body, which is our house, is torn down through death, the Amplified Version says, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, but eternal in the heavens. So we also need to remember that we are on earth, this is not our home, this is temporary. This is like a vapor. Um, eternity is where we spend heaven. Each, we are gonna be around forever, <laughs> forever. <laughs> so these years that we're spending on earth are a vapor, are us a grain of sand. I know it's wild to believe, to, under, to try to comprehend that, but this is so temporary. This is not our home and 
God brings us abundant life here on earth, but it doesn't mean complete heaven on earth. Um, that's reserved for heaven. In heaven, there's no sickness, there's no death, there's no pain, no evil. But on earth, these things d still do exist. And there will be reminders of that. There'll be reminders of that, um, that God uses to help us to lean on him more. And also to remind us that this is not our home. We are going to heaven someday and that's our home. And we're to be grateful for our home, for our place where we'll live forever with Jesus. And he'll give us reminders of this. Like, let me share with you just something that happened on uh, recently to me. Um, colds are a reminder that, you know, getting an occasional cold or something that we're here on earth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and things aren't perfect in our bodies, even if we are young and healthy, right? So um, right after Christmas, I came home and it was a strange, it was an amazing Christmas because God moved powerfully and we had church on Sunday. But after church, I came down with a cold and um, I was just kind of miserable in the terms of a cold, miserable for all Christmas day and night um, <laughs> when I got home and didn't sleep well, waking up all the time, no stuffy nose, all that. Um, and then my parents came to visit me the very next day. And um, they were there about a week and the whole week, I got over my cold finally on my birthday, before my birthday, so about a week. But the whole time they were there, I had a, a cold that was very uncomfortable. And um, Something I encountered with, this, with that cold I never had before, and that was like crazy coughing. I, I just couldn't get rid of a tickle in my throat. Could not get rid of the tickle. I've never had that happen before, but at night I was like, <laughs> constant coughing, constant. Never in my life have I had that before. Um, so actually, even though I was over my cold, that, that, that tickle was staying on my night of my birthday. I was just hacking like crazy, coughing like crazy. I was like, oh man, my parents are here for only a week. This is a bummer, you know? Um, and of course I was fully recovered like the day they left. But I had peace and joy through all of that. I had such an amazing time. I had abundant life with Jesus, peace and joy through that. And um, even the day after they left, I felt fully better. The cough finally left, but I went for a run. And when I went for a run, like five minutes into the run, um, I started coughing. It's like the cold air just came in my, you know, irritated. And when I coughed, I like pulled a muscle under my rib <laughs> because turns out the muscles under my rib had been so worn out, so weak, so worn out, strained from coughing so much that it pulled a muscle. And praise God, I'm pretty much fully healed now. But if I take a really deep breath, I can feel a slight pain, but not bad. But at first it like hurt to breathe deeply and to cough and to sneeze and everything and laugh. Um, but I'm healed now, hallelujah. But I just wanted to mention that, just how like every single one of us, we go through these things that aren't necessarily always the devil, <laughs> but it's just, we're on earth and we're not in heaven. And this is just our temporary place, this is not home. And we just go through things, we go through things that are uncomfortable. We can go through health thingies that is not like a lack of God moving in our lives, but just a sign that we're on earth, you know, and, God uses everything for the good. God uses everything to strengthen you, to refine you more, whether it's an attack sent from the devil or it's just like what I went through, just being on earth and going through things on earth that we have to deal with. So um, it's important for us to remember that, whether it's stuff like this that, I'm dealing, that, I, that I dealt with in my life, like you may deal with, um, when it comes to your body, when it comes to your physical health, but also if it is a thorn in the flesh, it's important to remember this is temporary where we are here on earth. Um, and also, um, now I want to mention right now, uh, these complexities of people who are older and have sickness. So first of all, wouldn't it be nice to all be like Elijah and not have to go through dying, just be taken up to heaven? Wouldn't that be nice? Ooh, that would be nice, right? But that doesn't happen usually. 
I think we just hear it one, we just hear it very few times happening. But when people get older, they go through dying and most of the times it's not, um, not always, but most of the times it's not like um, a person is older age and they're perfectly healthy and then they go to sleep and then they just don't wake up and they went to heaven and there's no pain at all. There's no kind of like dying experience. It's usually not like that. You know, as it says in the scripture, for we know that if the earthly tent, our physical body, which is our house, is torn down through death. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So the reality is, as we've seen a lot of amazing, powerful men of God, usually older, later in life, but not always like in their 90s, but younger even, some would say they were taken too soon. Many of them um, go through sickness and that's, that's how they end up leaving the earth. That's how they end up passing, transitioning into heaven. Um, and this is where we start to get into the mysteries of God where there's not a great answer for it. We don't really have the answer for it, but we just trust that God is good and he's faithful. And we humble ourselves that we don't have to know everything and every detail of why God allows certain things or why certain things happen. But we can understand this and be at peace with this, that we will die someday. <laughs> And it'll, it'll be a glorious day because we're going to heaven, our home. Hallelujah. This is not something depressing. We know where we're going. It's exciting. Um, but, I mean, most there hasn't been a recording of someone living past 120 or something, I think, in a while. You know, So we, pr we pretty much know, you know what's going to happen. And so I think we need to be at peace with knowing that we're on earth. This is our, uh, this is temporary and that, Dying happens, but this means we go to heaven and that we don't know how it'll happen. Um, but the way that our body dies, our physical body dies, it, it could come with pain. It could come with, it could, you know, we, it, sometimes it's the way that God has the transition take place, you know. Um, so we should be like at peace of that rather than Blaming God and being filled with confusion, for example, when loved ones, you know, pass that are older, for example. Like I said, we, this, this lifetime is such a vapor. And um, like if you think about, I was thinking about it the other day, eternity is not even a million miles. It, it's not even a billion miles. It's more than that, you know. But let's pretend that it was a billion miles. It's way more. So try to picture a billion miles. In your head right now try to picture a billion miles okay and I'm just gonna use this as an example a billion miles is your life is your life which most of it spent in eternity is your lifetime but part of that life is spent on earth and that's about the size of this compared to a billion years or sorry a billion miles and actually way more right eternity never ending <laughs> a billion times a billion times a billion times a billion but look how small it is, you know? And so sometimes we get so mad with God when maybe like a loved one passes because we think we wanted them to stay another year or five years or 10 years or 20 years or something. But for them to leave he here, here instead of here, um, if that was God's plan, in the scheme of things, we sometimes were just too much not thinking eternity minded. And we take all this blame on God when God did nothing wrong. There's nothing. This was God's mysterious plan and purpose. And God used that person well. And now this person gets to be in Jesus with heaven. And God is using this circumstance of losing maybe a loved one to help people in their lives lean on him more, strengthen them more. We just need to think more eternity-minded when it comes to death, when it comes to loved ones passing um when it comes to and then when it comes to younger people who pass too early um and maybe they were where the anointing was maybe they did have such strong faith maybe they tried you know and we still and they surrendered everything and we still see um we see one pass that is just a mystery it's just a mystery of god there's some things that 
it's not our job to know or understand or figure out. I'm teaching you things how to know and understand the complexities of God in terms of healing. But um, this is one of them that it, I, it can't be explained. It's just a mystery. And so we have to just rest in God and, and know He's faithful. He's good. I don't understand, but this doesn't change His goodness or faithfulness. And I will not allow my not understanding and things not going according to my plan to make me believe in God less, to worship my God less, to trust Him less, to surrender less. I will praise Him through everything. He is God. I am creation. There's so much I will understand, and my life is in His hands. Amen. Um, and then lastly, lastly, I want to share a story in Second Kings, Second uh, Kings twenty-one twenty verse one. Okay, this is a story of a king Hezekiah. It says, "In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death, and Isaiah the prophet." went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Wow, so this was like actually God's plan for him to go then. So God actually sent this prophet instead of saying be healed to deliver this word of God to him. So verse 2, it says, Then he turned his face, Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall, and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out in the middle of the court that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your, your, I will add to your days 15 years. I, was, I will deliver you and the city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. So, Hezekiah, you know, he had been serving God. He had been a servant of God, but we can see that there wasn't a place of like fully surrender or there could have been of some backsliding going on. And God was ready just for him to pass. Um, and by the way, sometimes when God takes someone from this earth, let's say especially if they're older, but maybe, maybe you as a loved one wanted them to live longer, you know? Sometimes it can be that God can see, though they're a child of God, though they love God, but they might be tired and not, not really wanting to keep staying here and doing God's work. Um, it's not that they become lukewarm per se. Someone can really be saved, but there can be cases when an older person just gets tired and is just ready to go home. They've kind of decided and in God's grace, God doesn't get mad and is like forgetting all that they've done in their life for him and is like, well, you're kind of lukewarm now. I'm sending you to hell now. Like God is not like that. He has He has grace, and so God can take someone. Be like, okay, it's it's just time. Just it's just my timeline to take you now. You are not going to be more effective for me on the kingdom. I'm I want to take you to heaven now. So uh, that can happen. That can ha that can be sometimes when we see someone passing when we like really wanted them to live, like really, really old or something, and that doesn't happen. Um, it's not always that it was, it was just the, it, it was the devil winning. No, like God decided I'm ready to take my child now. And um, so what we see with Hezekiah is interesting. So we're seeing Hezekiah was a servant of God. He was, he served him, but you know, he, he came into this place of maybe not full surrender, 
maybe, maybe backsliding, maybe not being as serious about doing work for God, serving him. But then um, the prophet says, your time's up. You're going to die now. You're going to pass now. And Hezekiah just repents. And Hezekiah gets this passion in him to stay longer on this earth and serve God, though heaven sounds amazing. It's just he got this passion to keep working, keep laboring for God on this earth. And he genuinely repented. He wept bitterly, it says. He really, 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 really repented for not staying in that place of complete surrender to God. And um, God heard his prayer and God changed his mind. Our repentance can have God change his mind. It's, you know, because we have free will. We're not robots or puppets. We have free will. So sometimes that can happen. So this is what it says. You, God says he's going to give you 15 more years. I have seen your tears and I will heal you. So I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you in the city and I will defend the city for my own sake. So we can see that happening too. That's why I, I share with you, like I, I've shared recently, man, if we can be like fully surrendered and I'm like fully surrendered and really serious about serving God, we should, we should ha have a, a serious faith that we're going to live a long life. God's looking for people who will really serve him um, and live long lives for him here on this earth. Um, that's why we shouldn't, we shouldn't ever fear dying. We shouldn't fear sickness. And, and at the same time, even if we know that we believe that we will be here for a long time because God wants us here, God has a lot of plans for us here, he has this assignment that we got to finish. Um, we're still at peace with God's timing for our lives because we're going to heaven. Heaven's going to be way better than here, <laughs> way better than here. So we as children of God should be at this place of such peace when it comes to our future. When it, and in terms of our relatives too, we should be at such peace, you know, knowing where we're going, knowing that where we're going is beautiful than here, but also being excited to advance the kingdom of God here and to be chosen by God to serve him here and expand his kingdom here and destroy the devil's kingdom here and earn a great reward in heaven. You know, as I was sharing, like, there are some people that, you know, God loves, they're true children of God, but maybe they're just not serious about surrendering fully and serving Him fully for later, later years in their lives. We will all have rewards in heaven, and there will be different kinds of rewards. There will be some with, with more rewards, with bigger rewards, and there will be some that still have rewards in heaven, but not as big, but still rewards, and it's all beautiful for everyone in heaven. And so that's kind of important for us to realize, like we have this choice. The more we surrender to God, the more we're gonna see abundant life here on this earth and the more God will protect our lives here on earth to keep going here on this earth for him, while at the same time being excited to go to heaven, being at peace with God's timing. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So those are the mysteries, some mysteries I, I God led me to share with you today. Um, revivals now, and we are seeing God move in such power, heal and deliver so many of all kinds of bondage and oppression and sickness. And our job is to believe in this, that God wants to heal us, God wants to deliver us, and that he's going to do it. Anything, any kind of bondage, any kind of sickness that we haven't heard testimonies of, God will do it. God is restoring this anointing and his power moving so powerfully through the church just as he moved through Apostle Peter. With Apostle Peter, it says, all were healed. All were healed. And I believe with all my heart that we're going to see that, that we're going to see um, so many, several, several, several services where every person testifies they are healed. Also knowing though that Peter, though it says that all were healed, there's never a promise in the word of God um, like saying that 
no matter what, every believer will be healed. But we know that the mo most are and that God wants us to believe for this. God wants this healing. He wants this freedom for us. But above all, he wants our surrender. Above all, we should want God to have his absolute way in our lives. That should be the very first thing. And that should be the biggest thing on our hearts. It's where the surrender takes place is where God is able to have his will be done. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want to declare right now, everyone watching here, um, some of you who have had loved ones pass and you've had you've been hurt, you've carried this pain you've carried this pain of sorrow of depression god is freeing you from this now i declare all of that pain and sorrow and just darkness you've carried in your heart i declare it must go now in jesus name i declare that heaviness to lift off of you i declare that dark cloud to move now and i declare the light of jesus sunshine from heaven to come down on you may you encounter god's love his warmth his presence his goodness his fire right now in jesus name be filled with peace now and there's some of you here who have become you've lost faith and you've become bitter and just confused because it because you've lost loved ones to sicknesses they passed away some of you who were really believing in this miracle that they be healed some of you crying out praying to God I want to declare all of that bitterness hurt unbelief must go from you now in Jesus name and I remove every word curse that you spoke over yourself, words of death, words of death like about God. I remove all of those now and I declare every spirit keeping you from intimacy with God must leave now in Jesus name. I speak over every person now, this anointing to touch you and I declare you to be filled with a peace that surpasses all understanding now that you would from today fully trust and rest in God, that there would be never a worry about the future, never a worry about your life and loved one's lives. I speak all anxiety, worry, fear must go in Jesus' name. And may you be filled with this spiritual insight now like may you always see this way that god, you can trust god no matter what that your life on this earth is protected and that you never die your family members never die you live eternally you live eternally your spirit never dies and so may you be filled with this peace with this joy of this eternal life this promise that we are given in jesus name Amen.